Watching the world burn, watching the world burn, February 18th, 2024. Let's get into it. So I've scoured everything and I wanted to pick up on news that you probably haven't heard uh, on any other channel or anywhere else in the world. Uh, as you know, Avdivka has fallen. Uh, and uh, But I don't, what I don't think that you probably know is that you know, in typical Russian fashion, I mean, where do the Russians always thrive? In the heart of winter. And uh, they have gone on the offensive big time. I mean, I, the advances that we're seeing, I mean, all of that buildup, 600,000 troops, tanks. Uh, by the way, somebody a while back told me the T-14 Amada was a piece of junk and it was dead. No, they're still working on it. So that tank may see the light of day before the end of the war. Probably not. But uh, so they, someday that, that, that tank is going to be, I, I'm predicting this, it's going to be the most amazing tank in the history of, for probably for the next 50 years, if they ever perfect it. Uh, but anyway, that's just the T-14 Armada. But anyway, right now we're seeing Russia advancing rapidly on all the fronts. The Israeli, I mean, the Ukrainian army is crumbling all of the, along the way. I do believe this, this war is going to be over a lot sooner than uh, anybody is predicting. I don't see it going on much longer. I mean, uh, it, it's the losses because they've got the Russians have total air superiority. They can just sit there and just pound the Ukrainians day after day. I mean, they dropped 500 bombs on Avdivka in a week. Why do you think it crumbled so rapidly? I mean, when you've got that kind of firepower, and there's no army on the planet that can stand against that. I don't care what you got on the ground. You know, if you can't uh, take the, the airplanes out of the air, but... Let's get into just some, some quick little news things that you haven't heard about. Uh, it is reported that Admiral Viktor Shokalov has been removed from the position of commander of the Black Sea Fleet, which he held since September 14, 2022. So this is, I just brought this one up because this is a big, big difference between the Russian military command structure in the United States. When was the last time you heard a four-star general in the United States being uh, removed from command? One of them Ivy League boot-licking suckers, you know, that we got in charge of the Pentagon. But, uh, but so the Russians, and I, I'm sure that this was over the fact that that ship uh, was hit and sunk, but I have yet to get any confirmation on that. But it seems like there's a lot of there's just too much out there. I, I do believe that ship was hit and sunk. If you don't know, you can go go read about it. I'll just read you the rest of this. Allegedly, Vice Admiral Sergei Malefichitz <laughs> Pinchuk has been appointed the new commander. I guess the loss of another landing ship was the last nail in the coffin. So that, that's very interesting. But I did want to just show you the difference between the Russian military and the United States military in that uh, they'll take people out. Uh, oh, you know what, before I continue, um, you know, the big interview is coming up. I want to ask everybody that uh, watches me, um, if you had your opportunity in the sun to interview one of the greatest military minds or be interviewed by one of the greatest military minds in the world, what question would you ask? What question would you ask? I mean, the one that I'm thinking about is who do you think was the greatest general of all time? You know, in my opinion, it was Stonewall Jackson, but... Uh, I ran a survey, and right now Patton uh, is probably getting about the most votes. Uh, e EU rejects extension of Russian gas transit through Ukraine. We are not interested in extending the transit translateral gas transit agreement with Russia, which expires at the end of this year, says EU Commissioner Kadri Simpson. According to her, the EU has alternative options to ensure security of gas supply. For the time being, the main goal is to stop using Russian gas as soon as possible. So, <laughs> the EU, <laughs> they're doomed, man. Uh, they're a bunch of, they're led by the, a bunch of idiots. I mean, uh, Angelina Baerbach and all of those people. I mean, if the, you could put together a, a dumber uh, ruling class in Europe, I, I, well, only in the United States, our, our dumb you ruling, you, you ruling class. We'll just get one more here because I'm going to get into something that, that I think that you'll find interesting. According to French media, the Kiev regime tried to lure French President Emmanuel Macron to Ukraine in order to murder him and then blame the death on Russia in order to bring media attention back to Ukraine and increase financial and military aid from the West. So other people have reported on this. This is probably not new news to you if you got, a, got your nose to the ground like I do. I just thought it was very interesting. Uh, and uh, 
let's see one more uh, this is uh, this is cool this is Simplicius uh, the thinker great news yesterday a portable electronic warfare system for attack troops tailored to combat UAVs was already in com is already in combat tested during the attack our guys got caught in a P FPV attack the drones dropped 100 to 150 meters from the group uh, let's see from the group and was hit the, and hit to hit the group with drones the combat operation was completed the lives of the soldiers were saved so the device has already paid for itself in full now if you look back on my videos I talked about you know how drone technology was going to advance you know we, we've seen better and better drones you got kamikaze drones you got you got swarm drone swarms you got uh, 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 you know obvious surveillance drones but obviously the, the, the next phase of, of what had to happen is you're going to counter that drone technology and, and then of course there'll be a counter to the counter to the drone technology so right now we're seeing the first uh, uh, use of electronic warfare on the battlefield to take down those drones now where do I think we go with all of this? I think that on the modern battlefield, at some point in the future, drones are going to be obsolete. Because eventually the enemy is going to be able to target them, jam them, uh, bring them down with electronic warfare, capture their signals. And this technology is going to improve and improve. So drones are going to become more and more difficult to use on the modern battlefield. Now, it, are, are drones still going to be an effective weapon? I mean, you know, yeah, if... if uh, Russia wanted to bring a bunch of drones here in the United States. I, they could destroy everything. <laughs> we don't have any of that technology to, to fight with the drones. So they're going to be around for quite some time. But, but I did tell you, want to tell you that. Uh, so let's get into the next one. Um, uh, this is Empire of Lies. I, I thought this was an interesting uh, post. Uh, this is not war. This is not self-defense. This is cold-blooded murder of children, not minors. The, the Associated Press. Breaking. Health officials say more than 12,300 Palestinian miners have been killed in Israel's war on Hamas in Gaza. Now, I think it's much more than that now. But uh, so we'll uh, well let's get the, the next one out of the way. Yeah, this was this was interesting. You didn't hear about this in the news. Uh, the Russian army created a Tsar train of 2,000 cars, 30 kilometers long in Donbass. It's actually a mobile line of defense, writes the DS analytical source working for the armed forces of Ukraine. A continuous structure of freight cars stretches along the line from the railway station in Yalinsknovka and has about 2,100 cars of various types. The construction of this carriage centipede began in July of 2023, the message says. The super train can be considered a separate line of defense since it is extremely difficult to damage move or explode a 30 kilometer mass of metal and the advancement of equipment due to such an obstacle is impossible without breaking through the corridor according to the ds so i just thought this was really cool i who would have thought of using a 2003 <laughs> 2000 cars 30 kilometer long train I, I tell you the russians are pretty inventive aren't they i mean i i just think that was pretty cool all right we'll get into the next one here so Analysis, dislike of, of Russia, uh, February 11th. I've spent maybe meaningless, sometimes both reading and participating in debates between pro-Russians and pro-Ukrainians. This has made me to conclude that many pro-Ukrainians not just support Ukraine, but they also hate Russia and the Russian people. Among pro-Russians, there isn't normally the, any hatred for the Ukrainians and people in the West. For the most part, uh, most time, they just despise those in the West who hate Russians and or support the war. I must admit that some pro-Russians also express a hatred for, but not much against Ukrainians, but also but against Poles and the Baltic peoples. And then it goes on from there and just talks about the hatred back and forth. But, you know, that's something that, you know, if you hear, listen to Colonel, uh, I mean, Colonel Douglas McGregor or Scott Ritter or uh, Daniel Davis, uh, all the people on YouTube, um, that is something they said. You know, Russians, they don't they don't hate the Ukrainians. They just, you know, they got to kill them, unfortunately, until they surrender. I don't know why they don't surrender. I mean, at this point, it's just a, it's a massacre that's taking place. We're looking at uh, 1945, World War II, same damn thing. So uh, I guess that's it for the video today. I'm going to make a second video. We're going to do a reading 
from the book about uh, Pickett's Charge. And I, I'm trying to get that video up today. But anyway, I guess uh, that's it. Uh, do I want to do one more here? Let's see. Yeah, this is all about the long war strategy. Uh, well, you know what? This is very interesting. Let's, let's get this in before I end the video. Because uh, this is Armchair Warlord. Ever since mid-2020, the Russians have continuously pursued a long war strategy in Ukraine, seeking to grind down the AFU and exhaust NATO's ability to fuel the war while building their own capabilities. It has largely succeeded. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And we're seeing that now all along the fronts as Russia is rapidly advancing. Why did Russia think it would work? Well, it's easy to see now, two years into the war, the Western war stocks were shallow, and Western military industry was a rusted-out shadow of its former self, and would be unable to gear up to supply the Ukrainian military, regardless of the amount of money NATO was willing to push in. Rather than translating into a mountain of steel on the battlefield, Western riches have only made each shell cost a mountain of cash. <laughs> That's very interesting, because it is true, you know, uh, all the orders that are going in for the shells now, I mean, the shells have like doubled, tripled, quadrupled in price. So uh, how long, you know, we're $35 trillion in debt now, so I guess uh, we'll just keep buying shells uh, and, and paying four times as much for them. But exactly none of this was obvious two years ago, even to NATO. In fact, to this day, they are bewildered NATO leaders still using the enormous disparity in GDP as a talking point in their favor. Despite this, the Russians deliberately set out to fight an industrial war against the combined might of the West. Notice he says the West. He doesn't say Ukraine. And, and, that's, and that turns out they were right. Uh, it was, you know, because they did end up fighting the West. Now, one could argue they simply weren't able to win a short war and got lucky, but that isn't a serious position. The Russians had ample means to try for a quick win in 2022, and they chose not to use them. Clearly seeing a long war is a sure bet. Rather, rather, luck in war is what happens when preparation meets opportunity, and that is exactly what happened here. Well, he didn't talk about the fact that Putin had been uh, gearing up the Russian industry for many, many years, uh, uh, you know, retooling things. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm sure he saw the writing on the wall. He knew this war was coming, and uh, they spent at least the last 10 years before the war working on their industrial capacity. And what shocks me is that the West didn't know anything about it. <laughs> I, mean, how could you, I mean, I guess they, our spies in Russia, or maybe they did know about it. They just didn't think it was possible. I don't know. It doesn't make sense to me. I mean, are, are, are billion-dollar or, or trillion-dollar intelligence services that stupid? I guess they are. So it's something of an article of faith in the modern West that Russian intelligence services are feeble with the little ability to penetrate Western governments or operate effectively in the public space. Their frequent use as scapegoats for the failures of Western liberals notwithstanding. Certainly the threat of Chinese infiltration is taken far more seriously in the United States, at least in public. And yet here, the Russian government in 2022 clearly understood NATO's military industrial capabilities far better than NATO itself did, to such a high degree of confidence that someone as risk adverse as Vladimir Putin would stake a war strategy and to a very real extent the survival of the Russian state on that analysis. Yeah. I mean, the, obviously with the sanctions and everything else, the West wanted to bury Russia. They certainly wanted uh, Vladimir Putin out and they wanted to, uh, uh, you know, steal all their resources, which is what we did and we're doing in Iraq. We're stealing the oil or what we're doing in Syria. We stole their oil. Or like France did, and or you know, in the United States and Africa. I mean, this is what an empire, a, a, a belligerent empire, does. Not China. Now China goes out and they make friends with everybody, and then they steal their resources. <laughs> you know, I like. I think China's method is a bit better because the countries actually think that China is their friend, which they are to a certain degree. I mean, I, I think it's a, it, it is a mutual beneficial, but the Chinese always get more out of it than the country that they're working with. Let's just put it that way. This strongly suggests that rather than being something to be dismissed, Russian intelligence gathering and the analytical capability is now, in fact, as good as it ever was during the Cold War. The legendary KGB seems to be back in business, and perhaps their greatest coup of all has been to convince us otherwise. I just thought that was great. So that's it for today's video. Uh. I'm going to go ahead and, and do a reading from the book, but once again, you know, I want to reiterate, if you, if you had a chance to ask a question, what would it be? Peace out. Stay free.